Hello there. Guillermo del Toro likes to take Hollywood's forgotten genres and put his own spin on them. With his new movie, Nightmare Alley, he tackles the shadow-filled world of film noir. Ali Jan has the story. Step right up in the home, one of the unexplained mysteries of the universe. Nightmare Easy Alley tells the tale of a drifter who first joins a carnival and then eventually becomes a swindler. The film is set in 1940s New York and has the makings of a classic film noir. Mr. Carla. Doctor. The doomed anti-hero is there. So is the femme fatale. And of course, there's the darkly lit cinematography. Circumstances. But despite using the usual archetypes and iconography, director Guillermo del Toro approaches the genre from a different angle. Absolute truth. Absolute truth. He did this before. With The Shape of Water, he took the Cold War paranoia-laden creature features of the 1950s and gave it a character study aspect, as well as a happy ending. This time, he gives film noir, a Hollywood glamour-like production quality. See, back in the day, unless it was a Howard Hawks picture or a Billy Wilder one, most noirs went for the gritty, unpolished look. But Nightmare Alley has lavish sets and costumes. And unlike its predecessors, it's shot in color photography, which received high marks from most reviewers. Critic Leonard Maltin was also impressed. He notes how Nightmare Alley's characters are more than stereotypes and praises the way the director gets audiences invested in them despite their bad deeds. But, you run a racket. but there are also those, like The Guardian, who think the movie's director is only trying to add prestige to the pulp genre with a soulless movie. The Shape of Water was pulpy as one could get, but that didn't stop the picture from becoming a hit. It earned Del Toro four Oscars, including Best Director and Best Picture. So it could just be that yesterday's pulp might very well be today's gold. Let's talk more about this with Marco Steen, who's written a book called Nightmare Alley, Film Noir and the American Dream. So, Mark, you both love the novel and uh, the 1947 movie adaptation. I want to go into the details of that and how you came to write the book on uh, The Nightmare Alley, of course. But right now, I'm curious to find out about what you think about the latest version, uh, Guillermo del Toro's version. Do you think it justifies its existence after two good examples? Well, that's a great question because the 1947 movie is really powerful. And it's got a great performance by uh, Tyrone Power in the lead. I think it has some new things to offer, the Del Toro version. Um, the cinematography is gorgeous. Um, it is in color, of course, but it seems as though he's trying to make it as close to black and white as possible. There's a lot of very dark scenes, rain and snow, and mostly browns and oranges in the color. <clears throat> and of course, he uses a lot of the shadows and the uh, slatted lighting that film noir uses. And I think it's a, it's a story for our time as well as for the 40s. Uh, at least in part because of the idea about <clears throat> how people can be swayed and taken in by con artists. And, uh, you know, now with social media and so many people believing in conspiracy theories, uh, the idea about confirmation bias and um, people's gullibility is certainly really relevant for today. So I think in that regard, it's, <clears throat> it, re it merits the remake because uh, the themes are so pertinent to what's happening right now. And, you know, Del Toro brings his own sensibility to it. Uh, it's kind of like a fable. If you've seen any of his other movies, you know he he uh, likes to use sort of fantastic elements. Uh, so, for example, in The Shape of Water with all the water and the, the sort of monster there. Um, and so it, it has kind of a fable-like quality to it, which is not really in the 1947 version. So I think that is something new, too, that Del Toro's uh, adaptation brings to the table. Okay, well, sounds like you enjoyed this movie, but if you had to compare the two, the 1947 <laughs> uh, adaptation and this one, would you say this is better? Ooh, that's a toughie. 
Um, it is more faithful to the new one is more faithful to the novel because of the uh, uh, motion prediction, you know, production code. They had to have a happy ending to uh, the 1947 version. And that really is kind of a clinker because it is a grim story. You know, at the end, well, maybe I shouldn't give a spoiler, but um, there's a tacked on ending to the 47 version that kind of ruins the mood. And Del Toro did not compromise. I mean, it, it's a very bleak story which is what the novel is. So um, it's more faithful and I think it's worth watching. I, if I had to pick a favorite, and I'm pretty partial to the 47, I have to say. Um, so I guess it's a toss up. I, I know that's not what you want to hear. <laughs> they both have their own strengths, let's put it that way. Okay, well, without uh, giving any spoilers, of course, you mentioned that there are differences uh, when it comes to the endings of both versions. Uh, tell us right. why this is important. This is not only important for the storytelling, but of course, uh, you have a book on it, and your argument sounds like uh, it, it is very closely linked to the endings. That's correct. That's a, an excellent point. Well, I guess um, the idea, one of the ideas I have in the book is that film noir, the films of the 40s, these crime films, were a sort of sustained critique of certain American myths about the about the so-called American dream. That is, you can rise from nothing with your by your bootstraps, um, and uh, you know there's equality and you know there's class mobility, and this movie shows that there really isn't. Along with lots of others, the theme of fate is very strong in film noir. Uh, in other words, you're destined to be something, and you can't get away from that that destiny. And so the the bleaker ending preserves that quality and the tacked on happy ending kind of destroys the arc of the story which is that um again I, I don't want to give a spoiler but there's something in stan carlisle the protagonist nature that has already doomed him uh it's it just plays out the way it's supposed to and so when you have a happy ending that doesn't really match the story mm -hmm. it sort of violates the main arc uh, of the plot okay building up on this uh where does uh, Del Toro's movie stand in the noir genre? I mean, it's a genre first for the director. I think he's trying to make a film noir uh, because as they say, he creates, it, you know, those movies of the 40s were all in black and white. And this is in color, but it's, it's about, a close, about as close to a black and white color movie as you can find. As I say, he really uses a lot of uh, the ambient uh, weather, snow, rain, and so forth to make it, there's very little light in the film. And most of the colors are um, subdued, you know, earth tones, browns and blacks and so forth. So that part of it is very noir. And, you know, in, in a certain way, it's more faithful to the idea of noir, which, again, has this strong theme of fate. Uh, and also the strongly Freudian story that Stan wants to kill his father and uh, the character of Lilith sort of is, becomes a stand in for his mother. So it's got that very strong Freudian idea that's very much of the 1940s, less so of today. So uh, it's kind of like a throwback in all those regards. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think critics agree on, uh, you know, visual design and art direction of the movie is just, you know, spectacular. But then yeah. what do you think about the non-visual elements in the movie? I mean, some critics seem to have a problem with the storytelling. The storytelling, yeah. Some of the problems are in the novel itself. Um, some folks have said the ending feels rushed. Uh, a lot happens in the last five or 10 minutes. And unfortunately, that's a problem with the novel also. Uh, after Stan uh, is sort of exposed and as a fraud, um, a lot happens really fast in a few pages and it does seem sort of hasty. And the film does not, it doesn't uh, compensate for that. It really, a lot is squashed in the last few minutes. So. The first part's kind of slow moving, and then the very end is really very fast paced. Okay, well, uh, we don't have much time left, but uh, you know, I'm curious about one particular thing. Yes. Why is it called uh, The Nightmare Alley? It sounds like a place, ah. but you know, I think <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, neither the film nor the novel mentions it. So where is this alley? Either one of the films mentions that. It actually is in the novel. There's a couple of scenes um, in which there's a st really strange scene in the novel where Stan seems to be kind of hallucinating and he kills a police officer. And he is in a nightmarish alley at that point, and that's where the title comes in. 
neither of the movies has that in there. Um, and it's part of the story that he's always been in the nightmare alley and he can't get out of it. And so we have a kind of blend of the dream state and the waking state. And it's, you know, it doesn't really call it, say the word, the words nightmare alley, but there's two scenes in the novel where that's invoked. But you know, neither one of the films has that. That's correct. Okay, well, let's end it there. Marcus Dean, it was good to have you with us today. Thanks so much for taking the time. Millions of tourists come to Barcelona every year to see the architecture of Antoni Gaudi. But Catalonia's National Museum of Art says there is a deeper story to tell about the man. Salome has more. Dreamlike shapes covered in cotton candy colors. This is the quintessential image that comes to mind when we hear the word Gaudi. Tourists travel from far and wide to lay eyes on his buildings. So much so that Gaudi's still unfinished Sagrada Familia attracts over 4.5 million visitors every year, putting him at the center of the city's multi million dollar tourism industry. But a new exhibition in Barcelona wants to prove that there's more to Gaudi than just quirky shapes and souvenirs. Organizers spent over four years gathering 650 of the architect's least known works from private collectors and institutions spread across the globe. Somebody so popular, uh, so visited by millions and millions of persons, in a logical way, has the, the, the discourse about him, the narrative about Gaudí, has been simplified. For example, being a genius who has a kind of magical or mystic inspiration, being somebody isolated from its time. The show tries to explain just the opposite. It's an extremely well-instructed, formed, educated person, architect. He's a man of his time, and his work is precisely the representation of his time. So it's to put, again, him in context. So instead of the isolated, misunderstood genius, the exhibition suggests that Gaudí was a superstar among the rich and the famous. The country's bourgeoisie, along with the Catholic Church, were among his most prominent clients, and they commissioned him to design everything, including their lounge chairs. Organizers felt that it was crucial that Gaudí's work be observed through an historic lens which is why the exhibition takes us back to the Barcelona of the early 1900s. And as newspaper El Mundo suggests, it was at the time a city on fire. Far from the vibrant, jovial escape Barcelona has become known for, Gaudi's Barcelona was one of a violent class struggle, a factor that significantly impacted the architect's work. Gaudi, which is uh... Uh, extremely religious man uh, uh, and also extremely Catalan. He's living in a, in, a, in a city that at that moment has a very growing bourgeoisie, rich people that makes new houses, new art, uh, this, uh, this uh, industrial uh, development, next to a very, very convulsed uh, social uh, fight. And for example, uh, is the moment that in Barcelona it happens the, what we call the tragic week, which is the burning of hundreds of churches by the anarchists and by, by the workers claiming for better conditions of work, etc. Gaudí may have rubbed elbows with the rich and the famous, but he nevertheless was a man of the masses. It's why more than a million people attended his funeral in 1926, and millions more come to Barcelona every year to see his work. Salome Fancel, TRT World. The media and the fans are in a deep discussion over who should be the next 007. So we thought it was the right time to introduce you to the Eurospy. Here's Ali Jan. Our man in Jamaica. The international success of James Bond prompted the national cinemas of Italy, Spain, France, and others to copy it. They basically recreated the 007 formula on a smaller budget. The exotic locales are still there. So are the interesting gadgets. 
and the super agents with names reminiscent of the famous English spy. Our man in Jamaica is suave and debonair. This attempt at coming up with the next bond created a cottage industry during the 1960s. These films are today collectively known as Euro spies. They reflect the Cold War times they were made in, with James Taunt, or Agent 077, fighting spectra-esque organizations and Blofeld-like master spies. Euro spies, like the Bond franchise, also needed brand faces for audience appeal, and they created their own stars. Actors like Ken Clark and Margaret Lee are closely associated with the Euro spy film movement, as much as Daniel Craig and Ava Green are associated with James Bond, and they still have a devoted fan base around the world. But make no mistake, these films have an original raw style to them and a gung-ho approach when it comes to action direction. Then there is the intricate plots and intrigues. And these qualities distinguish Euro spies from their original source of inspiration and make them enjoyable on their own merit. Their production qualities may not be as high as those of the 007 movies but they helped in further developing international co-productions within Europe. As a result, these countries carved themselves a place on the genre filmmaking map. The Eurospy craze started hot in the heels of Dr. No's 1964 release and held its ground almost throughout the decade. Today, its influence can be found in non-mainstream espionage movie fare, like 2015's Man From UNCLE and the OSS 117 films. And what these features offer is an unconventional alternative to a genre dominated by the slick Bond style of filmmaking. Secret agent Gary relentlessly hunts down the leader In the end, Eurospies are first and foremost travelogue adventures. And even though they live in the shadow of James Bond, they present a unique type of visceral entertainment. Eco-friendly houses tend to be examples of modern architecture, but one Jordanian man built his with traditional techniques. Here's his story. This dome-shaped house is grabbing attention for both its looks and its architectural techniques. It's the work of Hamid Yusuf Nazal. He used mud and other eco-friendly materials. He also got help from specialists. Nazal was an English lit teacher, and now this has become his full-time hobby in his hometown, Mafrak. The best way to build is in harmony with nature. The recipe for construction is the materials of earth, straw, goat hair, and ash which are accessible to everyone and go back thousands of years. Today, eco-friendly homes are becoming more popular, partly because of the COVID-19 pandemic, but they tend to have more modern features. And for Nazal, his traditional mud house, which took five years in the making, is as good as it gets when it comes to sustainability. It is known that the mud wall is a living organism that breathes, expands and contracts and is subject to atmospheric factors. This building is also weather adaptive, warm in winter, cool in summer, low cost, sustainable and long lasting. Nazal is also pleased that his house has unintentionally become a tourist destination. He says he's happy to teach both locals and foreigners about historical construction methods. But he didn't have a plan. He says his house shaped itself and now hopes he can inspire others to make their own unique and eco-friendly homes. Ronnie Spector, the lead singer of the 1960s band The Ronettes, has died. Spector passed away at 78 after a brief battle with cancer.
Her most famous hits were Be My Baby and Baby I Love You. The armorer on the set of Rust, Hannah Gutierrez Reed, has sued the ammunition supplier for the movie. She's accusing him of leaving live rounds amidst dummy cartridges. As a result, it's believed that Alec Baldwin fatally shot the film's cinematographer. No criminal charges have been filed yet. The 94th Academy Awards will once again have a host. That hasn't happened since 2018. The Academy announced that Glenn Weiss will fill the position for the telecast. But it is still unknown who will perform. The Berlin Film Festival will start next month in person, but with restrictions. The festival will use half the seating capacity and introduce strict COVID-19 protocols. It will also be slightly shorter, with only six days until the golden and silver bears are handed out. Mattel is set to release a new Barbie doll in honor of journalist and civil rights activist Ida B. Wells. The doll is from the Inspiring Women series, a collection of present-day and historical role models for girls. And now, people online can enjoy a virtual tour of the closed Notre Dame Cathedral. The 45-minute trip starts at the construction of the building and ends with the 2019 fire. It also includes a service inside the building and view from the top of the one of the towers. The cathedral is set to reopen in 2024. In an interview with Variety, Kristen Stewart said she didn't care if she won an Oscar for her role in Spencer. Well, that's a pretty good frame of mind to have considering what just happened. Is she here yet? Last September, Spencer premiered at the Venice Film Festival. Since then, many critics have thought Stewart will receive an Oscar nomination for Best Actress. And SAG Awards nominees are seen as a first step to Oscar nominations. So that's why when the nominees of the 28th Annual Screen Actors Guild Awards were announced, many critics and fans felt disappointed. Stewart wasn't nominated for female actor in a leading role in a motion picture category. The social media reactions came in following the live Instagram announcement. Writer Lauren Barrett's Logstead posted a tweet saying, Kristen Stewart got robbed and the pile of awards she's received already for her starring role in Spencer all agree with me. Film critic Courtney Howard said SAG Awards failed to appreciate Kristen Stewart's performance. And this wasn't the only snub of the SAG Awards nominations. Dune starring stars such as Javier Bardem, Zendaya and Timothy Chalamet, did not receive any nominations. And on the TV side, HBO comedy series Insecure didn't receive any nominations for its previous four seasons. And this year wasn't any different. But there were surprises as well. House of Gucci dominated the SAG Awards film nominations, with three nods, including the top prize of best cast. 1900 and the Power of the Dog also has three nominations, including acting nominations for Benedict Cumberbatch and Kirsten Dunst. With her. Also, Troy Kotzer made history as the first deaf actor to receive an individual SAG Award nomination performance for his role in Apple TV's drama Coda. I believe in communism. Ted Lasso and Succession received five nods each and became the most nominated TV series this year. And then there's the news about the ceremony itself. After last year's virtual edition, the SAG Awards will return to an in-person show and it will take place in February in Los Angeles. And finally, the UK is honoring the Rolling Stones, which is marking its 60th anniversary. And this particular accolade has only been given to four other British bands. You could say it's something to write home about.
That's it on this episode of Showcase. Our YouTube channel, Instagram and Twitter accounts have more from the world of culture and the arts. I'm Elif Bereketli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.